For two days after this, I stayed at home, and my wife appeared to abide loyally by our engagement, for as far as I know, she never stirred out of the house. On the third day, however, I had ample evidence that her solemn promise was not enough to hold her back from this secret influence which drew her away from her husband and her duty. I had gone into town on that day, but I returned by the 2.40 instead of the 3.36, which is my usual train. As I entered the house, the maid ran into the hall with a startled face. "'Where's your mistress?' I asked. "'I think that she's gone out for a walk,' she answered. My mind was instantly filled with suspicion. I rushed upstairs to make sure that she was not in the house. As I did so, I happened to glance out of one of the upper windows and saw the maid with whom I had just been speaking running across the field in the direction of the cottage. Then, of course, I saw exactly what it all meant. My wife had gone over there and had asked the servant to call her if I should return. Tingling with anger, I rushed down and hurried across, determined to end the matter once and forever. I saw my wife and the maid hurrying back along the lane, but I did not stop to speak with them. In the cottage lay the secret, which was casting a shadow over my life. I vowed that, come what might, it should be a secret no longer. I did not even knock when I reached it, but turned the handle and rushed into the passage. It was all still and quiet upon the ground floor. In the kitchen a kettle was singing on the fire, and a large black cat lay coiled up in the basket, but there was no sign of the woman whom I had seen before. I ran into the other room, but it was equally deserted. Then I rushed up the stairs only to find two other rooms empty and deserted at the top. There was no one at all in the whole house. The furniture and pictures were of the most common and vulgar description, save in the one chamber at the window of which I had seen the strange face. That was comfortable and elegant, and all my suspicions rose into a fierce bitter flame when I saw that on the mantelpiece stood a copy of a full-length photograph of my wife, which had been taken at my request only three months ago. I stayed long enough to make certain that the house was absolutely empty. Then I left it, feeling a weight at my heart such as I had never had before. My wife came out into the hall as I entered my house, but I was too hurt and angry to speak with her, and pushing past her I made my way into my study. She followed me, however, before I could close the door. I'm sorry that I broke my promise, Jack, said she, but if you knew all the circumstances, I'm sure that you would forgive me. Tell me everything, then, said I. I cannot, Jack, I cannot, she cried, until you tell me who it is that has been living in that cottage and who it is to whom you have given that photograph. There can never be any confidence between us, said I and breaking away from her, I left the house. That was yesterday, Mr. Holmes, and I have not seen her since, nor do I know anything more about this strange business. It is the first shadow that has come between us, and it has so shaken me that I do not know what I should do for the best. Suddenly this morning it occurred to me that you were the man to advise me, so I have hurried to you now, and I place myself unreservedly in your hands. If there's any point which I have not made clear, Pray question me about it, but above all tell me quickly what I am to do, for this misery is more than I can bear. Holmes and I had listened with the utmost interest to this extraordinary statement, which had been delivered in the jerky, broken fashion of a man who was under the influence of extreme emotions. My companion sat silent for some time, with his chin upon his hand, lost in thought. Tell me, said he at last. Could you swear that this was a man's face which you saw at the window? Each time that I saw it, I was some distance away from it, so that it is impossible for me to say. You appear, however, to have been disagreeably impressed by it. It seemed to be of an unnatural color, and to have a strange rigidity about the features. When I approached, it vanished with a jerk. How long is it since your wife asked you for a hundred pounds? Nearly two months. Have you ever seen a photograph of her first husband? No. There was a great fire at Atlanta very shortly after his death, and all her papers were destroyed. And yet she had a certificate of death. You say that you saw it? Yes, she got a duplicate after the fire. Did you ever meet anyone who knew her in America? No. Did she ever talk of revisiting the place? No. 
or get letters from it. No. Thank you. I should like to think over the matter a little now. If the cottage is now permanently deserted, we may have some difficulty. If, on the other hand, as I fancy is more likely, the inmates were warned of your coming and left before you entered yesterday, then they may be back now, and we should clear it all up easily. Let me advise you, then, to return to Norbury and to examine the windows of the cottage again. If you have reason to believe that it is inhabited, do not force your way in, but send a wire to my friend and me. We shall be with you within an hour of receiving it, and we shall then very soon get to the bottom of the business. And if it is still empty? In that case, I shall come out tomorrow and talk it over with you. Goodbye, and above all, do not fret until you know that you really have a cause for it. I am afraid that this is a bad business, Watson, said my companion as he returned after accompanying Mr. Grant Munro to the door. What do you make of it? It had an ugly sound, I answered. Yes, there's blackmail in it, or I am much mistaken. And who is the blackmailer? Well, it must be the creature who lives in the only comfortable room in the place, and has her photograph above his fireplace. Upon my word, Watson, there is something very attractive about that livid face at the window, and I should not have missed the case for worlds. You have a theory? Yes, a provisional one, but I shall be surprised if it does not turn out to be correct. This woman's first husband is in that cottage. Why do you think so? How else can we explain her frenzied anxiety that her second one should not enter it? The facts as I read them are something like this. This woman was married in America. Her husband developed some hateful qualities, or shall we say that he contracted some loathsome disease and became a leper or an imbecile? She flies from him at last, returns to England, changes her name, and starts her life, as she thinks, afresh. She has been married three years and believes that her position is quite secure, having shown her husband the death certificate of some man whose name she has assumed, when suddenly her whereabouts is discovered by her first husband, or we may suppose by some unscrupulous woman who has attached herself to the invalid. They write to the wife and threaten to come and expose her. She asks for a hundred pounds and endeavors to buy them off. They come in spite of it and when the husband mentions casually to the wife that there are newcomers in the cottage, she knows in some way that they are her pursuers. She waits until her husband is asleep, and then she rushes down to endeavor to persuade them to leave her in peace. Having no success, she goes again next morning, and her husband meets her, as he has told us, as she comes out. She promises him then not to go there again, but two days afterwards, the hope of getting rid of those dreadful neighbors was too strong for her, and she made another attempt, taking down with her the photograph which had probably been demanded from her. In the midst of this interview, the maid rushed in to say that the master had come home, on which the wife, knowing that he would come straight down to the cottage, hurried the inmates out at the back door, into the grove of fir trees, probably, which was mentioned as standing near. In this way, he found the place deserted. I shall be very much surprised, however, if it is still so when he reconnoitres it this evening. What do you think of my theory? It is all surmise. But at least it covers all the facts. When new facts come to our knowledge which cannot be covered by it, it will be time enough to reconsider it. We can do nothing more until we have a message from our friend at Norbury. But we had not a very long time to wait for that. It came just as we had finished our tea. The cottage is still tenanted, it said. Have seen the face again at the window. We'll meet the seven o'clock train and will take no steps until you arrive. He was waiting on the platform when we stepped out, and we could see in the light of the station lamps that he was very pale and quivering with agitation. They're still there, Mr. Holmes, said he, laying his hand hard upon my friend's sleeve. I saw lights in the cottage as I came down. We shall settle it now, once and for all. What is your plan, then? asked Holmes as he walked down the dark tree-lined road. I'm going to force my way in and see for myself who is in the house. I wish you both to be there as witnesses. You are quite determined to do this in spite of your wife's warning that it is better that you should not solve the mystery? Yes, I am determined. Well, I think that you are in the right. Any truth is better than indefinite doubt. 
We had better go up at once. Of course, legally, we are putting ourselves hopelessly in the wrong, but I think that it is worth it. It was a very dark night, and a thin rain began to fall as we turned from the high road into a narrow lane, deeply rutted, with hedges on either side. Mr. Grant Monroe pushed impatiently forward, however, and we stumbled after him as best we could. There are the lights of my house, he murmured, pointing to a glimmer among the trees, and here is the cottage which I am going to enter. We turned a corner in the lane as he spoke, and there was the building close beside us. A yellow bar falling across the black foreground showed that the door was not quite closed, and one window in the upper story was brightly illuminated. As we looked, we saw a dark blur moving across the blind. There is that creature, cried Grant Munro. You can see for yourselves that someone is there. Now follow me and we shall soon know all. We approached the door, but suddenly a woman appeared out of the shadow and stood in the golden track of the lamplight. I could not see her face in the darkness, but her arms were thrown out in an attitude of entreaty. For God's sake, don't, Jack, she cried. I had a presentiment that you would come this evening. Think better of it, dear. Trust me again, and you will never have cause to regret it. I have trusted you too long, Effie, he cried sternly. Leave go of me. I must pass you. My friends and I are going to settle this matter once and forever. He pushed her to one side, and we followed closely after him. As he threw the door open, an old woman ran out in front of him and tried to bar his passage. But he thrust her back, and an instant afterwards, we were all upon the stairs. Grant Munro rushed into the lighted room at the top, and we entered at his heels. It was a cosy, well-furnished apartment, with two candles burning upon the table and two upon the mantelpiece. In the corner, stooping over a desk, there sat what appeared to be a little girl. Her face was turned away as we entered, but we could see that she was dressed in a red frock and that she had long white gloves on. As she whisked round to us, I gave a cry of surprise and horror. The face which she turned towards us was of the strangest livid tint, and the features were absolutely devoid of any expression. An instant later the mystery was explained. Holmes, with a laugh, passed his hand behind the child's ear. A mask peeled off from her countenance, and there was a little coal-black negress, with all her white teeth flashing in amusement at our amazed faces. I burst out laughing, out of sympathy with her merriment, but Grant Munro stood staring, with his hand clutching his throat. My God! he cried. What can be the meaning of this? I will tell you the meaning of it, cried the lady, sweeping into the room with a proud, set face. You have forced me against my own judgment to tell you, and now we must both make the best of it. My husband died at Atlanta. My child survived. Your child? She drew a large silver locket from her bosom. You have never seen this open. I understood that it did not open. She touched a spring, and the front hinged back. There was a portrait within of a man, strikingly handsome and intelligent-looking, but bearing unmistakable signs upon his features of his African descent. That is John Hebron of Atlanta, said the lady, and a nobler man never walked the earth. I cut myself off from my race in order to wed him, but never once while he lived did I for an instant regret it. It was our misfortune that our only child took after his people rather than mine. It is often so in such matches, and little Lucy is darker far than ever her father was. But dark or fair, she is my own dear little girlie and her mother's pet. The little creature ran across at the words and nestled up against the lady's dress. When I left her in America, she continued, it was only because her health was weak and the change might have done her harm. She was given to the care of a faithful Scotchwoman who had once been our servant. Never for an instant did I dream of disowning her as my child. But once chance threw you in my way, Jack, and I learned to love you. I feared to tell you about my child. God forgive me. I feared that I should lose you, and I had not the courage to tell you. I had to choose between you, and in my weakness I turned away from my own little girl. For three years I have kept her existence a secret from you, but I heard from the nurse, and I knew that all was well with her. 
At last, however, there came an overwhelming desire to see the child once more. I struggled against it, but in vain. Though I knew the danger, I determined to have the child over, if it were before a few weeks. I sent a hundred pounds to the nurse, and I gave her instructions about this cottage, so that she might come as a neighbour, without my appearing to be in any way connected with her. I pushed my precautions so far as to order her to keep the child in the house during the daytime, and to cover up her little face and hands, so that even those who might see her at the window should not gossip about there being a black child in the neighbourhood. If I had been less cautious, I might have been more wise, but I was half crazy with fear that you should learn the truth. It was you who told me first that the cottage was occupied. I should have waited for the morning, but I could not sleep for excitement, and so at last I slipped out, knowing how difficult it is to awake you. But you saw me go, and that was the beginning of my troubles. Next day you had my secret at your mercy, but you nobly refrained from pursuing your advantage. Three days later, however, the nurse and child only just escaped from the back door as you rushed in at the front one. And now, tonight, you at last know all, and I ask you what is to become of us, my child and me. She clasped her hands and waited for an answer. It was a long ten minutes before Grant Munro broke the silence, and when his answer came, it was one of which I love to think. He lifted the little child, kissed her, and then, still carrying her, he held his other hand out to his wife and turned towards the door. We can talk it over more comfortably at home, said he. I'm not a very good man, Effie, but I think that I am a better one than you have given me credit for being. Holmes and I followed them down the lane and my friend plucked at my sleeve as we came out. I think, said he, that we shall be of more use in London than in Norbury. Not another word did he say of the case until late that night, when he was turning away with his lighted candle for his bedroom. Watson, said he, if it should ever strike you that I am getting a little overconfident in my powers, or giving less pains to a case than it deserves, Kindly whisper Norbury in my ear, and I shall be infinitely obliged to you.'